Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining part two of this UK data service workshop named an introduction to time series analysis and forecasting. This is the code demonstration which will take place in R. Um, to reintroduce myself, I'm Nadia Kenner, and uh, we are joined today with Emma Green, who will be helping facilitate this workshop. So if you have any questions related to, you know, like, um, well, not related to the content, then please drop a a message in the chat and Emma will do her best to help there. If you have any questions related to the content, then please use the Q&A function because that means that I can view the Q&As and attempt to answer the questions throughout. I'm just going to give it a couple of minutes before we get started as uh, participants are still joining and then we'll uh, get started with the code demonstration. All right, so we'll get started with the code demonstration now. I um, hope everyone's settled in, everyone's got a drink and um, we'll Get, we'll get started. So yes, as mentioned, we're going to be taking this code demonstration in R Studios. Um, there are three R Markdown files that we'll be using in this. This is the intros and prerequisites file. We have a section one and a section two. In order to obtain this code that I'm looking at here, I'm going to show you how you can get this from GitHub. Um, I'm just going to turn my camera off as well because I'm in the way. So yeah, if you head over to GitHub, which uh, Emma, if you can post that link in the chat again, that'd be great. Uh, this is the repository that contains everything that you've just seen on my screen. In order to, <clears throat> in order to get the code onto your own computer, there are multiple ways to do this. You could just download the zip file, and this will be stored uh, in your documents on your computer. However, what this means is that if I make any changes to the code or make any updates to the code, you will then have to re-download this rather than, rather than just being able to pull the changes. So if you want to stay up to date with any of the changes that I make on this, then your best bet is to clone the repository. I will show you how to do that just in just a minute. But the third way to obtain this code, this code is to scroll down and in the readme file, I've attached some interactive binder links. And basically, this allows you to run this code without having to install R Studios or install kind of any other software. So you can work from this in like a cloud repository kind of thing. If you were to launch the binder link, which is here, you'll get something that looks like this. Uh, we can just ignore that. So once you open it up, you also see the three files. You want to be opening up the IPYMB file if you are using binder. But just some forewarning. That should happen because I, I, I closed it earlier, sorry. But Binder is incredibly slow. It takes approximately maybe six to eight minutes to launch the Binder in itself. And then running some of the chunks can take some take some time as well. So I would suggest using the, the Colab links. I'll open one up now just so you can see what this looks like. See, this opens up immediately. Uh, it's got all the code chunks available and you can run these. Um, Obviously, this will work a little bit slower as well because we are on a cloud-based like service. But um, yeah, if you're if you can't download our studios, I've had trouble that these links are available for you. But yeah, in order to clone the repository, you can click the big green button uh, and copy the HTTPS link. Once that's copied, you can head back over to our studio. Now, obviously, you won't be looking at what I'm looking right now because you haven't cloned it. But open, if you open up R Studio, you can click, if I can get to it, File, New Project. From New Project, you can click Version Control. And this is basically telling R Studio to connect to Git, which is where the code is stored. You then want to click Git again, because we want to clone from that repository. And all you have to do is paste that URL link in, give this the name of your choosing, and then choose where you want to store this on your computer. A little tip, if you are cloning the repository right now, again, this will take maybe like 30 seconds, not even to clone the code onto your computer. And I would suggest always opening this in a new session so that you avoid any um, projects that you're working on at the moment. So the reason that we um, tend to use our projects is because using our project automatically sets your working directory. And the working directory is just the file path on your computer that sets the default location for any files that you read into R or save out of R. So it's like a little flag, you know, somewhere on your computer, which is tied to a specific uh, project. 
And if you ask R to import a data set from a text file or to save a data frame as a text file or any kind of data frame, it will assume the file is inside of your working directory. Um, I'm not going to click create project because obviously I've already done this, but yeah. <clears throat> In the intros and prerequisites file, I've got some information again about how to uh, clone, your, clone the repository. I've got some information about the data sets that we're going to be using specifically um, in relation to Ashby's paper that was talked about in the previous webinar on Tuesday. There's some information about setting your working directory, but as discussed, you don't need to set your working directory if you create this project because this is done within that process. And the last um, step that you need to do before we can run uh, sections one and section two is to install the packages needed. To install a package in R, you can, use the install.packages function, and you call on your name of the package with quotation marks. Obviously, I've already done this, so once you, in, once you install a package, you won't have to do it again. But what you will have to do is load your packages. So in order to load your packages or to run a bit of code using our markdown, you can click the green arrow that points to the right, which will load the whole chunk or you can individually select a line of code and click uh, control enter if you're on Windows or command enter if you're on a Mac. And that will just run one line of code. So once your packages are installed, make sure to load these into your work, into your project, or um, you won't be able to work with the functions that I'm working with in section one and two. So yes, I've hope, uh, sorry for waffling on about setting up your directory, but it's very important because I always get questions at the start. So yeah, let's work through our first section. So in this section, we're going to be covering five main topics which were talked about in Tuesday's session. This looks at time series data representations. It looks at converting time series objects, making decomposition plots, checking for stationarity, which I think I've spelt wrong, <laughs> and applying rolling averages. So again, the first steps before doing anything in R is to load your necessary packages. Obviously, we've already done that, but it's not bad practice to just keep doing this so you don't forget. So, yeah, we will um, start this code demo by exploring some different types of time series data. When working with data in R, you need to decide the object class of your data at hand. And this is important because the object class you choose affects more than the data is stored. It will then dictate what functions will be available for the data pre-processing, analysis and plotting. because some functions, um, like I believe the forecast package, requires you to have a time series object rather than a data frame. Uh, R has, I believe, like eight different implementations of data structures for representing time series, so it can get confusing. The main packages include TS, which is R's base package, which means you don't need to install this package. Once you download, install R, these base packages are automatically installed. You then have packages like Zoo and XTS. Um, XTS is an extension of Zoo, but a very useful package for dealing with like time date variables. And then we have probably the most common package, which is the T-Sybil package, which is one we're going to be using quite frequently. So let's get started by exploring a uh, data set within R Studios. We're going to be looking at a data set called Kings. This data set contains the age of death of successive kings in England, I believe starting with William the Conqueror. And then, yeah, so we're going to use this data set to explore kind of the basic uh, structures of a time series data. The data set can be found in this document here. And luckily, we don't need to download this data set elsewhere. We can do this straight within R using what is known as the scan function. So the scan function evident here. This reads the fields of data in the file as specified by what option, uh, with the default being numeric. So in this instant, instance, I'm creating a new object called Kings. I'm uh, using the assignment operator and asking R to read this data set in from this HTTPS link here. Notice how the link is in quotations. Uh, if this was not in quotations, you'd probably get an error. And I'm also using the skip function just to skip the first three lines of the data set, as this just contains um, 
descriptive information about how the data was collected. It's not actually uh, the data. So if we go ahead and run that, you'll see in your console that we have read 42 items in. So let's have a look at what this data set is. So yeah, as you can see, we've got our 42 um, kings and the ages that they died at. We can access what type of data set we have by using the function class. As you can see, we are working with a numeric data frame. However, if we wanted to run our time series plot, you know, plotting our data on the x-axis and attributes on the y-axis, you need to tell R that this is a, a time series data frame. And in order to convert a data frame to a time series object, we can use the TS function from the base package. Now, because our data frame is univariate, all we have to do is call on this TS function, call in the matrix that we want to use. In this instance, it's the kings. And I'm assigning this to the same object. So this is just going to override what we already have. You could, you know, call this kings2 to stop confusion, but I'm just going to keep it as kings. Now, if we recheck the class, you can see that this has been noted as a TS. And a time series object is simply a vector or a matrix. So that's univariate or multivariate. And it has time indices for each observation, which allows us to then sample the frequency, allows us to examine the time increments between observations, allows us to analyze the cycle lengths, et cetera, et cetera. However, it is common to come across time series that have been like collected at regular intervals that are less than one year of the King's data set. You know, this could be monthly, weekly, or quarterly. And in these cases, we have to specify the number of times that the data was collected per year using a additional parameter. So let's have a look at what that parameter will look like. I'm going to show you this on a data set called births. This is also a data set that can be downloaded within R, so it doesn't involve any additional um, installation or downloads. <clears throat> but yeah. I'm going to use this births data set, which refers to the number of births per month in New York City from 1946 to 1958. I just want to make sure that everyone can actually see my screen. I'm going to zoom in. Apologies, I did realize it's quite zoomed out, but yeah, we'll zoom in now. So yeah, again, we're going to call in our data set using that scan function. We don't need to skip any lines of data because there wasn't any additional information provided. We have 168 items, so let's have a look at what that looks like in its rawest form. As you can see, we have quite a messy data frame here. Um, it's pretty hard to tell what's what. So, and this is because R doesn't know that there's a time variable within this data set. But we can use the frequency parameter to identify um, what type of time interval you're using. In this instance, because I know the data set is recorded uh, monthly, I want to apply the number 12, which indicates, you know, your monthly, your months within the year. You can also set a start and end parameter, which just indicates when the first, um, when the first data was recorded. So let's go ahead and run that line. And let's have a look at what we're dealing with now. This is a much neater data frame now. We have our assigned months helpful to the frequency parameter, and we have the years that this has happened in. Obviously, if you had a yearly data, this number would be represented by a uh, 54. If you had quarterly data, this would be four, and if you had annually data, this would be one. So let's go ahead and plot our time series data set. We can use the plot.ts function from the ts package to do this. It's a really simple code. All you need is plot.ts, and then you have to call on the data frame you're interested in. So let's have a look at plotting that king's data set first. This gives us a pretty simple but you know effective time series plot of the deaths of the successive kings in England. Obviously, this is a uni univariate data frame, so it's uh, very simple. So let's have a look at what would happen if we plotted a data frame that has seasonality, that has months present. 
this is a classic example of a time series plot. Uh, the plot.ts functions are really effective just for creating um, you know, quick and efficient plots, but there are problems with this in that there's no uh, title defined, you know, it's almost quite simple, but it tells you what it needs to tell. We can analyze a more or less an upward trend from about uh, 1947 all the way to 1960. So we can also uh, plot TS objects using ggplot to then extend these visualizations to make them um, better. And this is found in the GG Fortify package. We're going to be using a function called autoplot. Now, GG Fortify lets ggplot2 know how to interpret its TS objects. So they work together. It's almost like a low level ggplot method, but it's much simpler and easier to use to produce, you know, fairly complicated graphs. So again, let's have a look how this would look like on our univariate data set, which is the buffs. And this gives us a bit of a nicer, um, sorry, this is the multivariate data set, the, the, the buffs. So this gives us a bit more of a, a nicer plot, I would say. It's got some background uh, grids, but we can also extend this plot by adding further functions. So I've added a plot, a function called ts.geo, which basically specifies the type of line graph you want to plot. And I've also decided to fill this with the color gray. So let's have a look what happens here. Nothing happened, strange. Uh, let me try reload the package. How strange. Um, let me try a different function. So let's do ts dot geome equals line spelt buffs wrong. That's so strange. I'm not actually too sure why that's not changing. Uh, let's try one more. Let's try bar. This was literally working, you know, yesterday. So, <laughs> hey ho, uh, hopefully this works for you. What about if I added a, we could do a TS line type instead. I think that's one. We'll call this a dashed plot. Hey. Yeah, sorry about that. I'm not too sure why that's changing, but hopefully that does work for you in your own code. Um, this was working, you know, two minutes before this workshop, so very strange, but this is just, you know, basic visualizations anyway. But yeah, let's go on to looking at um, how we can make our forecasts using the auto.arima function. So as mentioned, the arima models, the auto.arima function basically returns the best arima model according to either the AIC or the BIC. And then the function conducts a search over possible models with the order constraints provided. Uh, we can use the auto.arima function, and I've created a new object called births arima just so that we don't override the original. You then have to call on the original data set and assign whether there is. Uh, if you have any seasonal patterns, which is true in this case. So let's run the births arima and let's have a look at the residuals. As you can see, this is automatically provided our values for the PDQ in uh, the non-seasonal elements and the PDQ in the seasonal elements. It's also identified that we are using a 12-month um, data set. So if you remember correctly, the P stands for um, the trend order. So this is telling us that there are two autoregressive lags in the non-seasonal component and one, one lag in the seasonal. With the D, which is the middle number, represents the differencing. So it's told us that We've had to difference this by one in both the seasonal and the non-seasonal components in order to make the data stationary. And then we have our values two and one, which represents the Q. 
and this is the moving average. So this contains, a two, contains two moving average lags. So we can then go ahead and also check the residuals. It's important to check the residuals because this in a, in a time series model, this is the data that's being like left over after fitting a model. And for many, but not all time series models, the residuals are equal to the difference between the observations and the corresponding fitted values. So using the check residuals function, you get a plot that brings up three separate graphs. Now these graphs show the naive like method uh, produces forecasts that appear to account for all available information. So in this instance, um, we can see that the mean of our residual is close to zero, which signifies that there's no significant correlation in the residuals series. The time plot at the top uh, shows that the variation of the residual stays much the same across the, the historical data, right? Apart from maybe this outlier here in, in 19, 1956. And this means that the residual variance can be treated as constant. You then have uh, the histogram of the residuals and the histogram suggests that the residuals might not be necessarily normal because the right tail seems to, you know, seems a little too long, although not, um, not uh, it's not too dramatic, but this isn't a perfect bell curve. So you'd have to question. So, we, okay, let's um, move on to then making the forecasts. We can make the forecasts using the forecast function from the forecast package. Again, I'm creating a new object called burst underscore forecast. And I do this just so we don't overwrite the previous objects. And we call on our model, which was the births aruma. Again, you can use the uh, H function to identify the time period, the time steps, and we're using monthly data. So let's go ahead and Uh, apologies, I'm not sure why that's happened. Give me one second while I can, while I revamp this. Uh, let me, I'm going to just call in the data set again and see if there was, sometimes this happens. Um, I'm a bit confused about that because this had just run prior to this workshop. How typical. I've got the right model in place. I'm using the right function. We've called on. That's a shame because I was going to show you how uh, we can create like really quick forecast, you know. But I mean, if anyone knows what that error means, that'd be great. I, I'm not too sure myself. Someone said that the code works on their laptop. So is it just me? Are people having issues um, making the auto plots and running the forecast? Or is this just me? Uh, yeah, sorry. So if this works for you, then great. Um, you should then be able to see <laughs> a plot that indicates the forecasted values at the end for another 12 months. And if you kind of remember what we did in our first session, you know, you, you model your, your variable of interest, you make the forecast, and then you plot it kind of following like these three steps. When working with crime data, um, typically there's another step which would involve identifying the time interval and I'll show you how to do that. Yeah, people are saying it works for them, but not me. So that's very strange, but I'm glad it's working for people. So we'll move on. So we're gonna look at decompositions now. If you remember, um, in the talk, we mentioned decompositions as a way to analyze if there is stationarity in your data set. Uh, decompositions then splits up those four components, which is the seasonality, the trend, the noise, and the cyclical variation. <clears throat> we can use the decompose function to do this on our birth data set. So let's have a look at what that'll look like. As you can see, this has added a new object called birth decomp into our global environment. So we can use the head function to look at the first 10 rows of data. 
now what we have here is um, we have our original data set in the first instance. We have our seasonal components in the second instance. We have our trend in the third instance. And we also have our random components. So this has been all split. It also tells us what type of plot we're working with. It tells us that we have an additive decomposition structure. This means that when all components are um, added, that then all components are added in order to form that trend. So let's have a look at how this will look visually, because obviously this is really hard to understand. We can use the plot function, which is base package R, that will give you something that looks like this. So you have your original trend, uh, sorry, original data, your trend, your seasonality, and your noise. However, I'm not really a fan of this plot uh, because it does look quite messy. So I tend to use auto plot function. Will it work? Let's find out. It does work, okay. Uh, yeah, so this gives you the titles of, you know, what each of these graphs are. Uh, someone has asked whether my libraries load correctly. Yeah, yeah, I didn't have any issues, um, you know, running this just before the workshop to make sure everything was working, but there might be an issue with like, the way I've set up binder links, possibly that might affect the code, but hey, as long as you guys are able to see the plots, then that's, that's no worries. Um, so how to remove seasonality from your data set and why would you want to remove seasonality? Many industries experience fluctuations in various metrics based on the time of the year. And, you know, we, we see this in crime as well. But this means that it's not possible to effectively assess performance by comparing data from one time of the year to data from another. Furthermore, these seasonal fluctuations can and sometimes be so large that they make you know important trends. Uh, they mask important trends hiding in the data. So if birth rate were to increase in September, for example, this could be due to seasonal variation, or is this an actual increase in birth rate? And to get these answers, we need to remove the seasonality from the data. And this process is called seasonal adjustment. In order to seasonally adjust your data, you need to minus the seasonal component from your original data frame. So I'm calling on a new object called adjusted births. And I am um, taking away that seasonal component that we got from the decomposition plots from our original data set. So let's have a look at what this would look like without a seasonal component. So as you can see, the um, trend becomes, you know, a little less clear. But the seasonally adjusted time series provides a way in understanding the underlying trends by removing the noise of seasonal fluctuations, so outliers and um, anomalies from the data uh, are easier to see. So what about, how would you then check for stationarity? If you remember, um, from the webinar, there was two ways to do this. This is the graphical way and the statistical way. And remember, stationarity is um, just when the mean is constant, the standard deviation is constant, and its cross covariants are also constant. And we need a time series object to be stationary in order to make forecasts. So the graphical way would be to examine that decomposition plot. which is, yeah, and the second way would be to use the statistical method. In this example, I'm using the augmented uh, Dyke fuller test, known as the ADF test. And yeah, this is a common statistical test. The ADF test belongs to a category of tests called unit root tests, which is, you know, the proper method for testing stationarity of a time series. Um, the, it also expands what is known, the ADF test uh, expands the dyke fully test equation to include high order regressive processes in the model. And we can use the ADF.test function to examine this. We can also do this on the uh, births data set. Oh, sorry, ADF test, births, 
And you see how, let's uh, first examine the data from Kings. So typically the p-value obtained should be less than the significance level, which is 0 0.05, in order to then reject the null hypothesis. So in this instance, I would say that the series is stationary or isn't um, stationary because our value is not smaller than 0 0.05 as, as seen here. And with the, the birth data set, we have a value that is less than 0 0.05, which would indicate that um, our data can reject the null hypothesis inferring that the series is stationary. I'm going to quickly just talk about the zoo package and then we can take a little break while we then move on to look at the crime data. But the zoo package is pretty important because it allows you to perform calculations containing a regular time series of numeric matrices and vectors. And yeah, I'm going to show you how we can look at some rolling averages in order to smooth our data. So your first step is to install the packages zoo and you also then want to load this into your data, data set you can use a require function to do this in this instance because zoo is also a data frame included within r so the first step is to load um the data set we're going to be using a different data set here which is the average temperature by month and year in nottingham and this also you know exists within r so if you call on the data function this will um, load in the Nottingham data set, as you can see in your values in your global environment. We can then plot this data set by using the plot function. So if scroll down. We have a very basic plot of what we are looking at um, from 1920 to 1940 with our values on the y-axis. So we can extend this plot by, uh, again, using auto plot to add labels to our y-axis and our x-axis. We can include a title using the GG title function. And we can also identify what type of theme we want to use. So if I run this plot and scroll down, we've got a bit more of a, a visually pleasing plot, right? And that we've got our titles and whatnot. We can also view the seasonal subseries by a function called GG subseries. And this basically plots out the seasonality for each month in like a separate plot or a separate trend, but on the same graph. And I really like this one because it helps to visualize all the seasonal components in your data a bit better. Um, but yeah, before smoothing this data, let's explore some quick descriptive statistics. And we could do this using the X table uh, package. So again, I'm just going to load that in for practice, and I'm calling in a new data, calling this to a new data frame called Nottingham Two. And we can view the descriptive statistics now by using the head function. As you scroll down, this will give us a summary of um, the frequency in each month from the first uh, five rows of data. That is. We can also use the summary function to get a bit more of an extended grid to have a look at each month. So this gives you the mean, the medium, and the um, quartiles. So your first step is to identify what type of time interval you have. Again, you can use the frequency function to do this. This is telling me that we are working with monthly data. Obviously, we did know this because you can, you know, pick that up from the summary statistics, but yes. So let's decompose this data and plot the separate trends. Again, I'm going to use that decompose function, calling on our original data set and identifying that this is an additive model. We can then plot the decompositions. And this gives us a graph that, we, that we've seen before. Um, or again, you can use autoplot, which I just prefer because it gives those titles. And it also makes the residuals into a, um, a line, a, like a bar plot rather than a line plot, which helps identify which of these values um, have high noise. And if we wanted to remove the seasonally adjusted data, again, we do this the exact same way by um, 
removing the seasonal component from our original data set. Now I don't, so I've called on a new data set called X, which is probably not necessary, sorry. Um, and taking away that seasonal component from our original data set, reading this into a new object. We then plot this trend. We then have a seasonally adjusted time series plot. And um, just if you are interested, you can plot the individual components of a decomposition by calling on those variables that we've seen. So you can plot the seasonal components. You could also plot the trends. You could also plot the random components as well. So what happens when we uh, smooth our data? Um, yeah, the reason we, we want to smooth our data is to see if there's too much fluctuations in the seasonal patterns. I'm calling on a new data frame called not underscore mean and using the roll mean function. In this instance, again, we call on our original data set, which is the not term. We identify the, the time steps in our interval, which is 12 months. I'm asking it to also fill in any missing values with an NA. And then we can align this um, to the right. And we use the fill NA function because um, there are not 12 previous months before this. So then we use align equals right to like model the 11 previous observations. Um, whereas align left would be the next 11 months. So yeah. Let's go ahead and run that and have a look at our uh, summary here. So this is a summary of the rolling averages from each month to each month. We can then plot this again using uh, the plot function, and this will give us something like this. So this is a uh, rolling average of our data frame. You can also add additional features to this um, plot function, so you could add a a y lim function and identify. I'll just set this thirty seventy. Oh, ah, full stop. There you go. So this basically like allows you to almost zoom in and zoom out of your data frame. It allows you to create a bigger plot or a smaller plot. And um, just briefly on the XTS pa pa package, as I mentioned, this is an extension of the um, zoo package. And this is useful to use when, um, and when your time series is made to be a bit more flexible. So I'll just quickly run through this as I am noticing the time already. But yeah, we're going to use a Nottingham data set again, and I'm going to convert this to an XTS uh, data frame. You might want to load it first to see. I always make mistakes, these things happen. Um, and that allows us to then use the x.xtx function, which is from this package. We then need to convert this into a matrix in order to then run the time series plot. And we can use a head function to analyze um, the data here. Uh, I'm just going to skip this part here because this doesn't actually involve any of the data sets we use, but this is um, this was just a like a made up data frame that I, I use, which kind of provides a good example about how to create a time series plot from an XTX object. Uh, I'll, just, I'll just run it briefly, why not? But I'm basically creating a structure that stores the number of hours that someone has worked along, has worked with some attributes about them, like their birth date. So I created a random object called hours with five random numbers. I've created some, um, dates as a date class variable, so that will be our time instant, instant, uh, time step, and I'm indicating some attribute information, which is their birthday. 
And then I use all of this to create this into a new XTX object called uh, work. And we can look at the structure of an STX, XTX object by using this function. Um, <clears throat> and when working with time series, it will sometimes be necessary to separate your time series into like core data and index attributes. Um, the core data is like the matrix portion of the XTX, and you can separate this from the XTX object using what is known as core data. Let's go ahead and do that. We can then view the class of core data, and it tells us that we do in fact have a matrix array. And in order to index this, you can use the index function. Oh, sorry. Yeah, this should say hours. Apologies. Or not. Uh, yeah. A lot of errors today. Apologies. Um, But anyways, these are just some functions that allow you to work with XTX objects. But yeah, that draws conclusion to section one. I am wary of the time. So um, we'll take a quick five minute break here while I have a look at any Q and A's and comments. Hi everyone. Um, I hope you had a, quick, a nice little, uh, little break, stretch your legs, got a drink. And we're gonna move on to the second part now, which is looking at that crime looking at some crime data and seeing how we can um, run those four steps that we had seen in Tuesday's session. So obviously without saying always load your packages, this is just practice. Um, but we are going to be using data from a package called crime uh, data. We are specifically specifically going to be looking at data from Detroit, which is from 2015 to 2020. And the crime data was collected from a, a website or a database called the Crime Open Database, also known as CODE. And it basically makes it convenient to use crime data from most, multiple US cities. All the data is available is free to use. And it's quite flexible in terms of what data you can collect from there. Uh, data can be downloaded by year, data can be downloaded by city. You can also choose uh, what type of data you want to use, whether it be the core data frame, whether this be an extended data frame or whether this be a sample of the data frame. So all you would have to do is, is change said, um, said word to extended or to sample but for our case i want to use the core data set which is like the raw data set um so oh another kind of interest oh, a really good um function here is a function called output equals sf and this basically allows you to install a simple features object and this would be useful if you're looking at mapping uh, crime data. So if you want to know how to map crime data, crime data, selfish plug, but we ran a mapping crime data and workshop not long ago. And you can use this data frame and apply the concepts that we talked about in the code demo there to, to have a go at mapping crime data. But in this workshop, we're obviously interested in that time component, so we don't need that. Um, but yeah, you can download the full list of URLs for data files. This does take a few seconds, so I'm actually just going to ignore this part. But it will let you download all the URLs from each different city. However, as I said, we're only interested in the years 2015 to 2020, and I'm only interested in Detroit. So in order to obtain this data set, I've called on a new object called crime. I use the get crime data um, function from the crime data package. I've um, asked it to only select the data from Detroit and only the data from 2015 to 2020. So if I go ahead and run this, uh, this will take a, I'd say about 30 seconds to a minute. Oh, well, that took longer than I thought, uh, quicker than I thought. If you see my objects, I have a new object called crime here with uh, a lot of observations, a lot of observations, but we can again view the first 
five rows of the data set using the function head, first six rows of the data set, sorry. So this is the data set that we're gonna be looking at. Before we even get going, let's have a quick look at the variables that we have. We've got uh, the city name, we've got the offense code, we've got the offense type, we have the offense group, we have the offense against, so if it's this other property or society, we've got the date that this had um, been reported on, we also have the longitude, the latitude, and the census block. Now, these three variables here are only really relevant if you do input that you are using uh, an SF object or you want an SF object. In our case, we're really only interested in two variables, and that's the date single and the offense group. So let's have a quick uh, go at just like exploring this data to see some of the general trends. So you can use um, the pipe function, which is part of the Diplo package to, kind of, to commit crime, to, uh, sorry, <laughs> not to commit crime, to commit code all in one chunk. I'm calling on a new object called offense count, and I'm calling on a data set called crime, which is that original data set. And this pipe function can be known as like, and then, you know, and then we want to group by the offense group, so that's grouping all those uh, crime types. And then we want to summarize the number of crime counts that have happened within each offense group. I've also got the arrange function here, which is basically telling it uh, to arrange the summarized data frame in descending order of the count column so that the offenses with the higher counts appear first in the data frame. Um, and the, yeah, so let's have a look at what happens when we group the data by offense type. Let's view the first 10 rows and see what we're looking at. So this has given us a data frame of just two variables. It's known as a tibble um, with 10 observations and two variables. So we have our raw count of crime for each different offense group. Um, you can view this crime uh, data set by, oh, sorry. If you click the offense group, this will open up the data set in the R Studio um, console, so it's a bit clearer. And as you can see, there are 32 different types of offense categories. Now you might notice that, you know, these categories that only have a few counts, they're probably gonna affect the data that you have because the variations are so low, right? If you were interested in like studying all the different offense groups, then you would need to do some data manipulation to remove these minor crime categories into like one crime category. And I've gone ahead and done that, but I'll show you that a little later on. So let's first just plot the offense count um, using ggplot. Um, this gives us a pretty, um, you know, quite a packed bar plot, but it has all the offense groups that happened and their count. So you can see that assault offenses by far are the most prominent crime, which is definitely not um, surprising. But as I mentioned, we are specifically gonna be looking at burglary offenses. So I'll show you how we can select just those burglary offenses a bit later on. Well, I'll show you how to do that now apparently. So in order to select only those crimes of interest, you can use the filter function from the Diplo package. So I call on the variable of interest in our crime data set, which is the offense group. And you can use uh, a double equal sign to then um, select which type of crime you are interested in, or which type of crime you want to you know, create into a new data frame called burglary. So if I run this bit of code here and view the first 10 rows, you can see that we are only looking at the offense group that covers burglary, breakering, and entering. Now you could quite easily select an offense type, um, but the reason I chose to do the offense group is because it grouped all the different types of burglary and it provides just a bit easier analysis for us, you know. Just out of, um, 
Well, just to let you know, obviously, R is case sensitive, which means that if you had spelt burglary with a capital B, and you can see that we now have zero observations, and this is because it couldn't select the correct variable. So make sure that when you are working with your variables that you type these in uh, in the exact same format that they are written in. I had trouble because I didn't realize that breaking and entry was had a and symbol rather than and and yeah, little things, right? But to rerun that, and you can see that now jumps back up to 47,000. <clears throat> so yeah, you may have noticed that some of our crime counts are really low, as I mentioned. Um, and if you were interested in studying more than just burglary, you want to look at all crime types, then you might want to do some data pre-processing and categorize those minor cr crimes into one category. You can use, so let's first group the offense types and count the data. So we already did this before, and this brings up this table, right? And it shows us that we've got like really low counts that if you were to run an analysis on this, it's just not enough data to significantly produce time series plots. You're going to have a lot of uncontrolled variation because one account of, you know, like a peeping Tom or a gambling offence, you're not going to be able to create forecasts from data that doesn't exist. So it's best to group these into to one category. So the first step is to remove those small counts of crime to reduce the unwanted variation. And you first need to um, mutate, that is to change your offence group variable into a character variable. You can check the type of data set, the type of variable that you have by using the class function. So if I ran the offence group, it tells us that we've got a factor variable. Um, however, when using um, case when, you need to ensure that your variables are character. And I'll show you that just in a minute. So this converts our factor fence group into a character fence group. Uh, I am now assigning all those crimes that have less than 1,000 crime counts into a category, a new category, called minor, as in, you know, minor um, offences. If we view this data set, we can see that these are the offences that all had less than 1,000 crime counts. Your next step is then to mutate this into your data frame so that you group all of those minor offences into one category in our original data frame. And we can do this using the case when function. Um, it basically updates the offence group column based on whether the value is found in the minor vector. If the offence group is found in the minor vector, then the value is replaced with minor crimes. So let's go ahead and run that. And now we can view this new category. Right here, line 15, minor crimes. We now have 3,515 um, crime counts, which provide a better grouping or comparison variable for understanding crime. So yeah, that's like the basics of the data preparation and understanding your data and exploring your data. We're now gonna move on to looking at our time date variables. We're specifically going to be using the burglary data set, which is just the burglary counts from Detroit from 2015 to 2020. So your first step is to identify that time interval in your data set, right? Um, but first, let's have a look at what type of data frame we have. As you can see, we just have a tibble or a data frame. However, some functions within the packages, such as Fable, require you to turn a data set into that TS object, as we mentioned last session. Um, you can still create time series plots without converting your data set, and I'll show you how to do this in ggplot. But first, let's explore the time variables in our data set. I'm calling on the date single variable from our crime data set. 
first. And it tells us that we have a, a posit variable. But let's have a look. So this is obviously going to be the same in our burglary data set because it's just a filtered data set. And this, this type of variable refers to a class that stores both, both, both date and time. And your first step would be to convert this date variable into a date object so that R can recognize this and we can work with some of the packages that require you to identify a date. We can do this by using um, a combination of functions. In this function, in this um, code here, we have three main functions which are mutate, we have as date, and we have year week. The mutate function is asking R to create a new variable named week. And I'm using the year week function to convert the date single, which is our date variable, in the burglar data to a week year object. That is our weekly data. And the as date function is then used to convert this year data, this week year data or week year object into a date object representing the first day of the corresponding week. So let's have a go at um, converting our date object into a recognizable date object in R. If we scroll along, we'll see that we still have Uh, yeah, so once that's done, you can then move on to counting the number of weekly crimes. Uh, we've established in our talk on Tuesday that we're interested in the weekly crime counts because this provides the best time interval for reducing variation. So your first step is to create a new data frame with the count of the weekly crimes. Um, I'm calling on a new data frame called weekly crimes. It just, just makes it a bit clearer. Again, I'm using the mutate function. So this is what I just spoke about in the previous code above, which is converting that year date, uh, that time, the date single variable into a workable date object. And I'm then asking it to count the number of crimes per week. So if we run this and have a look at the first 10 rows again, you see, we now have a new data frame that indicates the week that the crime took place and the number of uh, burglary offences that had happened on each week. There are also some few other steps to identify. Firstly, as you can see, we've got data from 2014 for some reason, but we're interested in data from 2015. So you want to remove that first row of data. And you can do this by simply calling on an integer, which is like identifying that this is row one of your data, so minus row one of your data. We then need to convert the date um, object into a t-sybil object. And a t-sybil object is a bit different to a tibble object because this is a time series ible, basically. It's letting you work with time components in a more easier way than a tibble would. Um, the index argument at the end here indicates the column in the weekly crime data frame that should be used as the time index for the t-sybil object. So it's just letting you know, or trying to let R know that our week is my time variable of interest. We then want to remove the gap. So that's removing um, kind of like any of the NAs or missing values or, or any missing gaps in uh, the weeks, then we can do that using the fill gaps function. And then we can remove the incomplete weeks by using a filter is.na. And let's print the first few rows of the data set. And now we have a cleaned data set named TSB, which stands for t uh, Weekly Crimes. So let's go ahead and start um, plotting our data frames. So as I said, you can plot a time series object uh, without 
having to convert this. So in this example, I'm using ggplot and I'm using the weekly crimes data set. So that's the one that hasn't been converted yet. Um, and I'm going to use ggplot to do so. I'm calling on uh, my week, my dependent variable as my week and my attributes as my count. And this is our first trend of, a, of our crime data in our we have data from 2015 to 2020. And as you can see in like 2017, there's this really a uh, large speak, uh, speak spike in our data set. So that's obviously something that's gonna need to be examined. We can also use um, ggplot in a different way by calling on your data frame first and using the pipe function to then supply uh, the aesthetics for a ggplot. Um, in this instance, I'm using geom point, which is a bit different to geom line. And this does give us something like this, which is very similar to the plot that we had seen in the workshop on Tuesday. Um, just out of interest for anyone who's, um, you know, interested in the coding part, you can run everything that we've just done um, in one line of code. You can count the weekly crimes, you can convert the date object, and you can plot this all on one line of code. So if you want to um, run this part of code, you just need to uncomment this. So you can use Control Shift C or Command Shift C if you're on a Mac. And this will allow you to do everything that we've just done in one line of code. Um, but yeah, although ggplot is useful in understanding the visualizations, it doesn't, it becomes difficult to understand the underlying components of a time series in that we won't be able to run decomposition models or examine stationarity or kind of any of that using um, a non-time series object. So yeah, again, we're going to convert this into a time series object. And we want to convert the weekly crime data to a time series object. Um, oh, apologies. I have used the data frame that is a T, a, a tibble rather than the T tibble. So I think we should be working with the TSB underscore weekly crimes rather than the weekly crimes, which is um, not a time series, uh, not a T tibble. So this converts our weekly crime data into a time series object. We've identified the frequency, which is 52, because we're interested in weekly data, and we've got our start and end periods. We can then plot our time series using autoplot, like so, or we can use plot.ts. And this gives us um, you know, two very basic time series plots. Your next steps again would be to check for stationarity. Um, it's important because your data needs to be stationary. Again, we're going to use the ADF uh, function to do so. And this gives us a p-value of 0 0.01, which would indicate that our uh, null hypothesis can be rejected because we it is lower than the p-value of 0 0.05 meaning that this data is stationary. Sorry, again, I think I've supplied the wrong um, um, If your data wasn't stationary, then you would need to perform what is called differencing and you can use the diff function from the base package in R to do so. So let's go ahead and run our decomposition plots. I've provided, I believe, like three uh, different ways for you to run a decomposition plot. You can use the seasonal decomposition from the stats package. Uh, this function takes the time series object as its argument and um, specifies the type of seasonal window to use. 
you can then pass the results from the decomposition into autoplot. So let's have a look at what this might look like. So using the stats package, we get something that looks like this. Um, we can also use, sorry, that's the STL package. We can also use the stats package, which is like R's base package, which we've already done. So that's just using the decompose function. We can then plot this. And that gives us that very basic and kind of unreadable random error plot, which I'm not really a fan of. Um, you can extract the individual elements or individual components if you're interested. And, or you could use the uh, forecast package. So let's have a look at using the decompose from the forecast package, but this time identifying if we have an additive or multiplicative plot to see the differences. It tells me straight away that this, a multiplicative plot wouldn't work because we are dealing with additive data. Um, so again, we have our original data, we've got the under overall trend, we have our seasonality, and we have our noise. Um, one other function I want to talk about before going on to looking at some Serema models is um, accounting for holidays in your in your models. So the time date package or the time date function, should I say? No, sorry, yes, the time date package um, returns a vector of week to year objects representing bank holidays in uh, across the across the globe. So we can use the holiday London function to return the bank holidays in London. However, reading this out loud, I've just realized that we are using data from New York and from Detroit, which means we wouldn't be using holidays from London, but instead holidays from um, New York. So you can use the double question mark and type in, the package that, um, I think it's holiday. Uh, I think rather than London, we want N, Y, S, E, there we go. So this indicates all the bank holidays in America, since we're using information, uh, data from Detroit. So yeah, this should be, N Y S E. Obviously, if you're using crime data from London, then go ahead and use the Holiday London one. Um, I will push the changes to this code. So what I'm doing here is um, this code assigns the result of the comparison using this function to a new column called Bank Holiday. And in the X data frame, it indicates whether each week is a bank holiday in New York or in America for the year of 2020. Um, we can go ahead and run this. And if we scroll down, oh, Uh, yeah, so this is basically, it gives you like a binary variable, it will say true or false, indicating whether that date falls on a bank holiday or not. Um, let me just have a look at if I can. Uh, yeah, so if you're running Serena models, it might be like important to consider bank holidays because this could affect the frequency of crime, right? If we want to establish like a cause and effect to see how the frequency of burglary from 2015 to 2020 had changed, we might want to include bank holiday as an exogenous like factor that could be affecting um, the frequency of crime rate, you know? 
can we say that the trends are reflective or like yeah all right so lastly we are on to our Serena models which is the last bit of code that we're looking on today. Um, so we use our Serena models to examine whether the expected crime counts are different to the predicted in a certain year, or to forecast the crime data and then compare the expected to the predicted. So we've um, got a few steps to do. The first is to subset a time series object, and we can do this using the window function. So in this code, uh, line 369, it's used to create two subsets, the train data set and the test data set. Uh, the training data set represents the data from 2015 to the end of 2019, and the test data set represents the data from 2020. So I'm simply just splitting this data off into two. But let's go ahead and run that. So if you look into your values, you'll see that we've got two added um, objects. I'll just move this along so we can have a proper look. So we've got our test and train here. You can see the test indicates we have data from 2020 to 2020, and our train indicates we have data from 2015 to 2020. Um, your next steps would be to fit that Serima model. In this example, I'm using the auto.arima from the forecast package uh because this allows us to automatically select the best Aruma model for time series data in this code i've also said set the seasonal argument to be true indicating that the time series does have seasonal components so let's go ahead and run our model and then your next steps would be to run the prediction uh i would ignore this line of code here for now sorry but yes, we want to predict the burglaries for 2020. And we can do this by running a forecast model on our test data set. So that's the... Um, sorry, just making sure that I got that right. Yes, that's the um, data set from 2020. If we go ahead, done that again oh no uh right let me see if maybe adding a level so this is like setting the confidence intervals so that any values that fall below or below these can be marked as in, in, insignificant so i'll set these to 80 and call it 95 I'm having the same issue there. Wow. Um, if anyone's actually able to run that bit of bit of code, that's the forecast, then could you, I, I don't know, give a thumbs up or something or just leave a word in, in the chat? Because I'm not too sure uh, what this error actually means. So, yeah, I do apologise about that. Let me just see if running a forecast on the whole data set. Um, yeah, I'll try the whole. Yeah, very, very confused about this. I do apologize about that. Sorry, guys. I um I had issues with the code a couple months back due to changes in the forecast package. And yeah, I've been struggling to effectively, you know, fix these. But if you are able to manage to, to run that forecast, then these auto plot functions should work for you. And this will show you um the expected crime count in 2020 compared to the predicted, which was established from the Serena models made in 2015 to 2019. Um, oh, I'm really glad that that isn't working, but I will, uh, if you're interested in, in doing this yourself and following the code that came from Ashby's paper in 2020, 
then you can head over to um, this link here. Emma, if you want to drop that link in the chat, that would be great just so people have this at hand. But this indicates um, how you count your crimes, how you model your forecast, and then how you can then model your results. So the code here is obviously um, was adapted from, from this paper and this, uh, this site, but yeah. That draws conclusion to this talk. Um, I hope that this has been an informative and engaging session for you and hopefully you've been able to um, apply some of the topics to your own work and start to question your own research questions. So yeah, that's, I believe, all the questions answered. So, and it's just reached 12.30. So we're going to call this uh, webinar here. Thank you all for attending, whether that be you attended both sessions or just one. Please complete the survey at the end. And um, yeah, thanks Emma for facilitating. And if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me via email or Twitter. Other than that, thank you all. We'll close off this uh, webinar here.